morning. Welcome to Presentational. Good morning, and I'm Pastor Walter. As you can see, we are both in different spaces. I think Jen, you're in Albany, and I'm in Philomath, so Corvallis is the middle. We're socially distanced this morning. We're socially distanced indeed. I can hear um, some feedback coming from somewhere. Um, so I'm just checking my devices to make sure that I don't have us on in some other window or screen um, to make sure that the volume, that the sound quality is decent or as decent as it can be this morning. So welcome to worship in another Sunday. We are um, happy to be here with you. The sound is bad, I'm echoing, Caroline says. Um, well, tell us if that's still happening. In just a few moments, you can um, text me or, um, or type into the chat and we'll see. Um, maybe Walter, if you turn your sound down a little bit and I'll turn my sound down a little bit. I, can hear, I think I can hear myself coming through. Um, in, you've, you've actually improved a bit okay. after, you, after you turned your sound down. Okay. So you sound, you sound pretty level-headed right now. Wow. <laughs> That's nice. Yes. Um, I think I can hear myself echoing through your device, Walter, but we'll just uh, keep going and see how it, how it goes. So friends, we are, um, yes, another week has passed. It's the 9th of August. The scripture text for the morning uh, comes from the Gospel of Matthew, probably a story that many of us heard in Sunday school or preached from the pulpit before. It's the miracle of Jesus walking on water. And that's what we're going to explore today together. So following worship, um, for, we'll do prayers of the people and um, then a brief meditation on the scripture. And then we will break out into our conversation groups again this Sunday. And then we'll have um, a link for coffee hour. And so um, we hope you'll join us for coffee hour. I know that there is some anxiety within certain um, parts of the congregation. Well, throughout the congregation, right? I think we're all anxious for different reasons. And um, there's some anxiety um, around um, what's happening in our building. So if you would like a place to work through some of that this morning and express some of your thoughts, you are certainly welcome to join um, to join me at coffee hour and have some conversation, which I have found is really the best way to work through anxiety um, communally and together as a group. So I want to invite us all just to settle into our space, wherever you're worshiping from this morning, wherever you're breathing into and settling into this particular um, communal space. Welcome. Settle in as much as possible, which might not be perfect. But I trust that whatever it is that we need this morning is here. And if our hearts are open and our ears are open, I believe that we will find something we're seeking, something that will help move us through another day and into another week together as we explore what it looks like to be human and to be together in this particular moment in time. So welcome to worship. Walter is going to lead us in bringing our full selves into this space. 
with prayers of the people. One of the things I love in our communion liturgy that we're not being celebrating today, but it says, you are welcome with your whole selves. And there is something about the, the fact that we are welcome with our fear, with our anxiety, with our joy and gratitude. Um, being a member of First Congregational Church means that there's nothing of you that cannot come into this community. In our morning prayer, we often say that the greatest yearning of God is for you to bring your whole self, to simply be who you are in the presence of God, and then also in the presence of our community. So in this time and where we share together, I invite you as you bring your whole selves here to share in the chat function what you bring to the table, to our community today, and know that even if there are some things that are even too hard to express, that we will be keeping that in our prayers too. And if you would like to share something with either Jen or myself, know that we will keep you in our weekly prayer practice. So I invite you now to join us and share what your celebrations and your concerns are and what's on your heart. C asks for prayers, C and Robin both ask for prayers for their, for their child and their relationship with him. Sometimes, God, it is hard when we struggle, when we are parents, when we struggle with our children whom we so deeply love. And sometimes these relationships are complicated and difficult and they get they cut to the bones and cut into our hearts because they seem so painful and they are so painful god we ask you for your loving presence for the wisdom for the right words and for friends who are along the way and hold us in your mercy god hear our prayers Connie asks for prayers for her adult son who is hunkered down or sheltering a place in Alaska in Anchorage. And of course, even more isolated because he's deaf. God, we ask you for Connie's son. We ask you as he's isolated and maybe feeling even more so because he's deaf. And we ask you not only for him, but we also ask you for Connie. We ask you for all of us who are isolated as we shelter in place, who miss connections, and also for us who miss them. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Jackie asks for prayers for all of those who are emotionally and physically experiencing the impact of being isolated and alone. God, the difficulty of not being connected. We were created to be in connection and relationships with one another. The impact that of that on our hearts and our souls and also physically 
can be very hard. It takes a toll. We ask you for your presence to remind us that we are not alone. And we ask you to put people in our way, to have people there who can stay in touch and in contact so that we know we are beloved. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Nancy asks for continued prayers for her father, who is at this point working with a cardiologist to discern what further treatment he is supposed to go through. God, there are people we love, sometimes close by and sometimes in the distance. And as we strive and struggle to journey with them, we ask that you give us the wisdom and courage we need, and we ask for their wisdom too. We specifically ask you for Nancy's father. Be with him as he makes decisions and discerns what his next medical steps are. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Christy asked for prayers for her mother who was hospitalized with congestive heart failure and also for her dad who is caring for her and navigating this whole different world of being hospitalized in the midst of the pandemic. God, we ask you for Christy's mother. She was hospitalized this week with congestive heart failure and as she is in the hospital, Christy's father is trying to find ways to stay connected, to be with her, to navigate this healthcare system in the age of COVID. We ask you for wisdom and patience and courage. We also ask you for Christy as she wants to journey with them. Give her the love and insight she needs. And we ask you for all who at this point in this time are navigating health and health crises and health issues and learning how to journey within a system that is immersed in the pandemic. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Drew is asking for prayers for those who are looking for employment. God, the pandemic has opened up so much of inequity. There's only a thin, thin safety net for many of us. We ask for prayers for those of us who don't have work or have lost their work and in the midst of that are struggling to find meaning and also to know where their next meal comes from and perhaps also whether they will still have housing. God, we ask you for your compassion, but your compassion in a way that turns our hearts open, ours and the government institutions. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. and ask for prayers for all who are facing eviction. God, to have a place to live gives a sense of safety. And to not know where you may rest your head the next day, to wonder about your personal safety, to wonder about a roof over your head for yourself and perhaps also for those you love, it is so hard. And God, we know that things could be different, but they often are. William Barber once talked about attention violence, that we do not pay attention to that which is important. God, open our hearts and our minds, and that we are 
with those who are facing eviction, but also that those who make decisions make wise decisions. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Christy asks for prayers for those who are mourning, who have been injured and who are grieving and who are facing the difficulty of their situation in Beirut. God, often we talk about human tragedy as a tragedy and we forget to remember that there are many of us who are responsible. We ask you for the situation in Beirut that those who are in power become more responsive and responsible to the people living in the country. We ask you specifically for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, for those who are traumatized and shocked and injured by what has happened. And we ask you for those who there do not have shelter. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Leslie asked for prayers for her nephew. God, we ask you for Leslie's nephew. Be there with him. Be with Leslie as she strives to be a loving presence. And be with all of us who worry about our relatives. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Lee asks for prayers for Suzanne, who is grieving the loss, the death of her Aunt Ruth, and also asks for prayers for closest family members, for her children and her grandchildren. God, we ask you for Suzanne. We ask you that you comfort her in the face of the loss of her aunt, we ask you for the children and grandchildren for whom there is an emptiness now. We ask that you comfort them with your divine spirit. And we also ask that your spirit put people in their way who provide the right words, who find the correct moment of silence. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Hazel asks for prayers for those among us who are struggling with isolation. God, we ask you for those amongst us who are struggling with loneliness and isolation. This has always been something that has been going on, but the pandemic has laid bare how many of us struggle with feeling alone and not connected with others. Please be present in their lives. Let them know that even if they walk in the valley of the shadow of darkness and isolation, they are not alone, but that you are present with them. And we ask you also to encourage us to reach out to find ways that we can be present. And Larry asks for prayers for forgiveness for the killing of the 300,000 people after of, of Nagasaki and also later of Hiroshima after the dropping of the atom bomb. God, we ask you for your forgiveness, for your forgiveness due to the horrors of war, due to the weapons we use. We ask you specifically to forgive us in the face of the destruction of Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. And that this forgiveness may be one also of our response of repentance, to seek peace with peaceful means. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers.
And there are so many other things on our heart. Sometimes there are things we cannot put into words because we cannot bear. Hi friends. I think um, I think it's working now on my end. And um, <laughs> sorry, Walter, for um, cutting you off for a minute there. Um, I'm hoping that this transition will hold and that the, um, the streaming service holds for us too. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I, Walter, we're gonna experiment with bringing Walter back into the feed. So we're side by side. Walter is going to um, transition us into the meditation with a reading of um, the gospel. And if that doesn't work smoothly, just bear with us and um, we will Hi, Walter. Okay, yes. Okay. We, we're back now. <laughs> Together. And we were actually just at this point in our prayers where I said, sometimes many things we cannot even say out loud. And I don't want to say it's serendipitous, but sometimes if we cannot say things that we want to say, and if we are disconnected in different ways, that there too, the presence of God is with us. And thank you for sharing your prayers and concerns with us as a community. It's always such an important part of my Sunday experience. And Jen has now asked me to transition to reading the gospel reading for today. And it's from Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was many furlongs distant from the land, beaten by the waves, for the, way, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, person of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. 
Thank you, Walter. So friends, this is our scripture reading that comes to us from the lectionary for the day. And as we um, enter this time of meditation, let's just take a moment to pause and pray together. Holy, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's interesting. I just um, I just noticed, I just heard as Walter read, um, O person of little faith. And that phrase may be the phrase that when you've heard this um, text preached before either from the pulpit or in Sunday school that was drawn out as, um, as important to consider or to reflect on. And this morning I haven't focused so much on that particular phrase, but it is interesting to me to note that in Matthew's gospel, little faith isn't actually an insult. It's not a critique. It's a statement that even with a little faith, much can be done. So if you've heard that um, that story before and that phrase as a critique of Peter, I don't think that that's um, probably the way it's intended to be read because over and over again in Matthew, little faith is called out as enough. So here we are with this um, story today about Jesus walking on water and Peter stepping out of the boat to meet him. But I think it's important to know what has just happened before we get to this story. And so we're going to um, reflect a little bit backwards together this morning. We've moved out of overt parables, meaning we've moved out from these um, seven or so parables that have come just before in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus is saying, I'll tell you a story but we're still in the land of parabolic narrative. If you remember a few weeks ago, um, I told you that parable means to throw alongside. So here's one way the world might work or does work, and here's another way that the world um, might be. So the author of, Gos of Matthew's gospel is still in this habit of throwing alongside this morning, meaning we're still being presented with, here's one way, to be in the world, or this is what empire business as usual looks like. But here's another way. The beloved community is like this. And that narrative framework is at play today in Matthew chapter 14. The author is showing us what empire looks like, but also offering us another way to be human. So we'll, we'll get to the focus on um, the story of walking on the water, but let's go back to the beginning of the chapter. So what's just happened at the beginning of chapter 14 is Herod has imprisoned John the Baptist because like Jesus, John is a troublemaker. And you may remember that Herod has been on a long mission to seek and destroy Jesus ever since the birth of the child. So having John, Herod's having captured John, made Herod and the empire one step closer to getting Jesus. And the text tells us that Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid that that might be going just a little bit too far because the crowds, and the crowds are everywhere in Matthew's gospel. They actually serve as a character in the story itself. The masses of the poor and disenfranchised, that's what the crowds represent, who the empire knows, the empire knows that those masses of the poor are so great that if they ever organized, if they ever organized, they could easily overthrow the system. So Herod is afraid to kill John because the crowds, the poor and disenfranchised, the folks who Jesus is speaking to, are the same that John is speaking to. And they regard John as a prophet like they regard Jesus. So Herod thinks um, if we execute John, his death might be the catalyst that organizes those masses. 
But we find Herod in chapter 14 throwing this party, which is probably a wild, opulent, royal shindig, and ends up promising John's head to Salome, his stepdaughter, who holds a grudge, um, along with her mother, against John. And that is a fascinating piece of um, of biblical and historical um, narrative if you're interested in digging into a little bit about why um, Salome had a grudge against John. You can do some um, internet research. But this morning, we'll just leave it at saying John is beheaded because of Salome's request and Herod feels like he has to follow through on that promise. And so the disciples come to retrieve the body of John from the palace and bury him. And then they go to tell Jesus. Now Jesus must be heartbroken. John is his cousin, the one he grew up alongside even when they were in the womb, if you remember Mary travels to Elizabeth while Elizabeth is pregnant with John and the babies dance in the womb and stay with one another for a long period of time. John has also prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus. He baptized Jesus into ministry. He's pointed the masses toward the teaching of Jesus. So John and Jesus have a close-knit relationship. And Jesus must also recognize this as foreshadowing, right? Because Jesus knows that it is only a matter of time before he dies in the same way that John died. And I imagine that Jesus can feel the end inching closer. So he goes to find someplace quiet, which is pretty typical of Jesus in the gospels when he's interacting with the crowds and doing something that we might think of as um, extra extroverted, the work of a prophet. It's often followed by a period of time where he retreats in order to, I don't know, to grieve, to pray, to regain his center. But by this time, by the time of John's execution, he is widely known as a healer and it is difficult for him to find a place where he can be alone. The text tells us that in this particular moment, the crowds find him and they follow him. And Jesus does what he always does. He gets busy, right? He feeds, and he heals. He does that even when I suspect he would rather be sleeping or just left alone to grieve and to mourn the life of his cousin. So Herod has wild parties for the wealthy and the royal with beheadings as entertainment. In contrast, here's the, here's the parabolic narrative. In contrast, when crowds gather around Jesus, they are the poor and the sick. The only entertainment here is healing and the teachings of compassion. Their meal, this crowd's meal, because the next thing that will happen is Jesus feeds the some amount of people. The text tells us that as those crowds followed Jesus and found him and Jesus began healing, and teaching, the disciples say, Jesus is getting late and these people need to be fed. So tell them to go home so we don't have to figure out how to feed them. And presumably they could feed themselves to the disciples. And instead of telling the crowds to go, as you know, Jesus says, no, we can feed them. They can stay. And this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Your, your Bible has probably named it in the header. And we know that that title isn't exactly accurate because it was 5,000 men who were fed, right? And women and children besides. So in this story, the meal of the crowds come from the abundance of probably what the crowds have brought, had brought with them, right? The loaves, the fish that were multiplied. It's the ethics of communal sharing being brought to our attention in the story, this particular feeding story of which there are many, 
by the way. But this is a parabolic teaching. Here is what the ethos of business as usual looks like, the author says. Here's how um, the empire, how Herod operates. And here, the gospel says, is how the beloved community works. When we arrive at verse 22, Jesus is still trying to find space to be alone, right? He tells the disciples to go. He says, go. I'll dismiss the crowds. You go first. But remember, they're in a deserted place that they had to get to by boat. Jesus had to take a boat to find this deserted location that he intended to go to alone. But people have followed him. So everyone has to leave by boat. Jesus tells the disciples to go also to leave in their boat and Jesus stays climbing the mountain or the hill or whatever was there in order to recenter. So the disciples get into the boat, but they don't leave. They don't sail away. They're probably waiting for Jesus to come back down the mountain so that they can take him to the other side. But they wait and they wait and they wait and Jesus doesn't come down. And while they're waiting, a storm comes. When the text says the boat was battered by the waves and the wind was against them. Battered by the waves should signal to us that they were in severe distress. Water in the ancient world, remember, is a place of chaos, right? That's where sea monsters come from. That's where sailors lose their lives and boats sink over and over again. In the ancient world, the sea is dangerous and deadly. And that's even um, resonated in our origin story in Genesis 1. In the beginning, when nothing else existed, water did. And the water was dark and chaotic. The creator separated the waters and brought order to the formless murmuring deep. But water, unmanaged and unmitigated, is a fearsome thing. And this particular night, it had been released from its boundaries and the disciples had spent hours the whole night, not on a choppy sea, but probably literally fighting for their lives while Jesus was absent. I imagine that over this long night, the terror and anxiety gripping the disciples was so powerful that they simply lost their minds. Like a powerful anesthesia, the anxiety of the moment overtakes them and they forget that they've actually been here before. Earlier in the gospel in Matthew chapter eight, they're in a boat with Jesus when the sea rises against them. And Jesus, remember this, Jesus stills the storm. This happens to us too, doesn't it? When we're in the grip of fear, it is hard to remember ourselves. And it is maybe even harder to remember what Jesus has done. I wonder what goes on for us. I wonder what goes on for myself that I can't remember. But things have been hard before, and I have been okay. I have been delivered. But I have never actually been alone. What goes on for us that sometimes we decide, but this time, this thing that's facing us, whatever it is, um, the renovation of the sanctuary, or COVID, or safe camp, or the argument I'm in with my neighbor, or my daughter, or my mother, whatever it is. Why do we decide that this time it's too hard? It's too complicated, and we lose faith. We lose faith that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, a light shining around our capacity to be strong and creative and resilient together. I can imagine what Peter must have felt when he saw Jesus. At first, the way fear distorts even reality for us um, makes Peter believe that he's seen an apparition along with the rest of the disciples, right? They say, it's a ghost. Why not, right? Things are pretty bad. Might as well bring on the ghosts and the spirits. 
But immediately, the text says, immediately Jesus spoke to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. The most repeated phrase in the scriptures, it's part of the theophany, it's a big religious theological word, theophany, the way God reveals the divine self. It's not any old self-identification from Jesus. It's not, hey, it's me, Jesus of Nazareth, your friend. It's one that echoes back to the revelation to Moses. I am, meaning I am who, what, how, where I will be. And it's a divine revelation that echoes throughout time. This is also the most consistent divine revelation. When Jesus says, I am, Jesus means Emmanuel. I am God with you, wherever, however, whoever you are. I am with you. The consistency of that divine revelation is paired with this notice. Do not be afraid. To see God is to understand that we are not alone and we can speak back to our fear. So Peter recognizes Jesus and wants proximity, like right now, immediately, and in his eagerness to join Jesus, to get to where Jesus is, in his momentary recognition of, oh, that's Jesus, and I want to go to there where I will be safe, where I will be um, relieved from my fear. He forgets for a minute, Peter does, how big those waves are and how much fear and anxiety he's carrying within his body. So in his excitement, he abandons ship, right? He couldn't wait for Jesus to come to them. He couldn't wait to see <clears throat> if Jesus would travel over to the boat. He doesn't consider his friends in the boat with him, right? He just moves as quickly as possible to get to Jesus. And for a minute, it works. He stays afloat until he remembers his fear. And that's when danger enters for many of us. When fear grips us so powerfully that it transforms us and we lose sight of what is true and what is real. But here too, we see how Jesus works. The text says immediately he reaches out and catches Peter because that is the truth about God. That is also the divine revelation. The Holy One is always, always moving toward us. Sometimes faith is seeing the boat for what it is a place to encourage each other, to be present with one another while we are waiting, while we are in the unknown and the fear and the anxiety together, waiting on God. But it is easy to want our own miracle, isn't it? Even if it arrives at the expense of others who are in the boat with us, we sometimes feel too tired or scared or wrapped in our own anxiety to remember that there are other passengers. It is often so much easier to just take care of ourselves. And this might be where we are today, friends. It might feel like all the energy we have is for saving ourselves. Maybe we're looking for our own personal revelation of the holy. We need God to reach out and pull us out of the terrifying sea. What if this story, too, gives us a different option, two different ways of being human in the world. Like Peter, we could jump out of the boat and run toward our own miracle. But maybe another way is to stay in the boat, to stay in the hardness, the fear, the anxiety, the not knowing what comes next. Maybe another way is to grab each other 
to have faith that Jesus is coming. God is not so far off. And if we're wondering what to do while we're in the boat, how to keep ourselves occupied, we don't have to look far for a model. We feed people, we bind up broken hearts. We take care of each other the best way we know how. It's not a great mystery, is it? Stay in the boat, take care of each other. Maybe pay attention to who else needs a life raft and help them in. Amen. Friends, I hope that you will consider breaking out into small groups with us this morning where we can have a little bit of discussion around the meditation. And there are questions that your facilitators have that may help you spark some conversation. Um, we do this over in Zoom. So I'm not sure if Anamika is going to put the Zoom link right here into the chat for us to follow. If it doesn't come into the chat, then you have that link uh, in your newsletter in the this week that was mailed from the church directly to your email inbox, or um, you should also have it um, on Facebook. You could go check us out on Facebook and find the newsletter. And in that link um, in the newsletter, you can find a link to um, the Zoom groups. So. I am signing off here and I hope to see you in a minute over on Zoom.